So you learned all about the things like BIOS lock enable and protected range registers, and you think you've got your hands on, you know, the attacks and the defense, but wait, there's more. So the attacker goal is still to write persistent malware to the spy flash. And let's say you as a defender have set up protected range registers and BIOS lock enable properly. Well, the attacker, as they are known to do, will then just go do something completely different that these things have no relevance for. For instance, they might attach to the spy flash chip. So let's see a little demo video from back in the day at our LegvaCore research. This is showing how an attacker can physically clip on to a spy flash and infect it. Now that was just showing you a USB power bank and it's saying that this Dediprog right here is not actually connected to a computer, it's only connected to power. So then I'm gonna start a timer and using only one hand, I'm going to try to infect this particular HP laptop. So this laptop is nice and ripe for infection because you simply remove a single screw and you will find the BIOS spy flash chip sitting there waiting for you. Also, there's an embedded controller. Also, there's, you know, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, stuff like that. So as I carefully try to clip on with one hand while also recording with the other hand, this particular Dediprog is nice, the SF600 Plus, because it has the capability to actually preload some BIOS onto it. And that's why I was making the point of this is not actually connected to a computer. It's just got power and then it's got a preloaded BIOS on it. So within about 45 seconds after pressing the start button, it goes ahead and rewrites the BIOS. So then the attacker can just, you know, close this back up. And obviously there is no, there's no evidence of physical tamper from that because, you know, you just clipped onto the chip for a little bit. And so the grand total of the attack using, you know, one hand, only took a minute and 30 seconds. So if you wanna see the particular proof of concept malware that was then injected into that code, you can go watch the rest of the YouTube video. So is this realistic? Can someone you know, just attach to something and rewrite its flash chip? Well, if we go look at the you know, NSA leaked catalog of capabilities that uh, Edward Snowden leaked, it talks about a variety of things that infect the BIOS and utilize system management mode. And specifically, if you look in there, it says through remote access or interdiction. So remote access would be if they compromised something, you know, up in the operating system level, and then they wanted to reflash the BIOS from the operating system. And interdiction has to do with the idea of physically, you know, interdicting, grabbing, and putting hands on a piece of hardware on its way to its intended destination. So this could be, for instance, it, you know, getting lost in the mail for an extra day. This could be you know, just uh, getting hands-on as it's, you know, leaving the shipping facility, etc. So basically the point is this Ant catalog is from 2008. 2008 was before anyone had ever shown any attacks on BIOS, like researchers. Researchers hadn't shown any attacks on BIOS, but the NSA already had it weaponized and they had, you know, programs in place for getting physical hands-on things in order to rewrite the BIOS. So if we go look through this, you know, the, the Ant product, product catalog, we can see many other instances of this, you know, through remote access or interdiction. ArcStream is used to reflash the BIOS. Uh, then there's the Iron Chef, which provides access to the BIOS and BIOS and SMM. And it says through interdiction, the implant is installed on the system. And then just for good measure, uh, there's also things like using interdiction to install Bulldozer, which is a PCI bus hardware implant. And then things like interdiction to install hard drive firmware infection. So yes, interdiction is, you know, physical access to a device is realistic. Um, back in, you know, when Joanna Rakowska talked about evil made attacks, she was talking about the evil made basically infecting the bootloader as a way to steal full disk encryption passwords. That's why at the very, very, very beginning of the class when I was talking about, you know, the ways that someone could infect the system, I said uber evil made would be if you infected the BIOS rather than the bootloader. Because the bootloader infection is going to be detectable through hard drive forensics, right? But the BIOS is not unless they have BIOS forensics capabilities. So an attacker could, you know, go into your hotel room and reflash the chip this way. So when I was making this original proof of concept for infecting the BIOS through physical attack, I personally was, you know, thinking about the attack of going and crossing a border, you know, so you're going to a security conference and, you know, maybe the border guard confiscates your hardware for a little bit, takes into a back room and says, you know, oh, we got to inspect this. And certainly, you know, some places are more likely to do this than others. 
And so with just a little bit of time and access, they could potentially infect your system. So what are the defenses against this? Well, one thing that's really just more of a mitigation than a defense is using different types of flash chips in order to make it more difficult to clip on and make it take longer to clip on. So if these are sort of, you know, the typical form factors of flash chips, you can say that this one is super easy because you can just use a chip clip and so you don't want to use that. This would be more if you were a, uh, a hardware maker, you know, if you're an OEM making hardware. You don't want to use that sort of package and you don't want to use this sort of package either because, you know, the attacker can still get access to these there. So you want to use these BGA, these ball grid array uh, packages where the pins are entirely below the thing because basically that would make it so that the attacker would have to actually desolder and resolder or they potentially would have to, you know, get access to something like a debug port that you added on. So this was just from some random Mac mini that I had some pictures of laying around from, from previous research. And, you know, if you have this kind of thing, that's going to be an easy, obvious target for an attacker. But also just if you have these sort of exposed traces, even if you removed this, those would still potentially be a target. So the traces have to actually be, you know, buried in the motherboard that then becomes, you know, more costly and so forth. So if you leave that kind of debug connector on, you will see stuff like this show up on the Chinese market. You know, the nice, easy to attach ways of clipping onto the, uh, you know, the connector for a spy flash. So, you know, this can be had for just 97.99. And actually, you know, I had gotten a, a cheaper version of that uh, previously. So what else can we do about this? Well, there is a thing called eSpy, Enhanced Zero Peripheral Interface, and it has a variety of ways that it can behave that can be beneficial for building a secure system. Now, there's a concept of slave attached flash and master attached flash, and you have to actually go into a Intel document that's called the Addendum for Servers, so the eSpy Addendum for Servers, and this talks about this notion that on a server system, you might have you know, the main processor that has eSpy capability, and then it might be connected to the BMC, the Baseboard Management Controller. And the BMC on server systems is typically the processor that comes up first and then it lets the x86 out of reset. The idea being that you know, someone could remote connect to the BMC and do firmware updates, do software reflashing, do general provisioning, because in server infrastructure, you've got a whole bunch of boxes and they don't want humans walking around to them. All they want them to just be able to be remote managed and that's the BMC's job. So the BMC typically will come up first and that means it has to have its own flash in order to boot up first. And so in this sort of topology, you could have the x86 not actually having its own direct flash, but instead being connected via eSpy to the BMC, which has its own flash. So there's you know, two different ways of doing this. There's the master attached flash where the CPU master has eSpy and the spy flash chip is shared between the slave and the master. And then the alternative, which is the better version, is slave attached flash. So here the you know, CPU, the x86, has eSpy to the peripheral, could be a BMC, or as the reason I'm going this direction is because in the context of the T2 Max, the peripheral was the T2 Mac, and the T2 did actually come up first. And then you'd have you know, nominally the eSpy attached to the T2, sorry, the, the spy flash chip attached to the, the T2 via eSpy. Now, in practice, you know, it wasn't actually done that way. If we did it that way, you would still just have the exact same sort of clip-on attacks. And, you know, obviously, you know, I want to defend against those sort of attacks since I was proof of concepting them out. So the CPU, the x86, is connected via eSpy to the T2. And then, you know, in some architectures, you could have the on-chip flash, which would be literally baked into the processor. But in our case, we used it via encrypted storage. So the T2 has you know, hardware encryption for NAND storage, and it actually manages all of the NAND storage, both for the x86 side and the T2 side. And so basically you just have encrypted storage and you have a copy of the x86 spy flash image, and then the you know, peripheral, the T2 comes up first and it you know, verifies that image and then it can feed it to the CPU via eSpy. So the x86 is trying to access the reset vector at FFFFF0, and what it's doing is it's accessing some memory mapped IO on the T2, which has loaded up a copy from the encrypted storage and stored it into memory. And so as far as the x86 is concerned, it just looks like 
any other sort of boot from this embedded spy flash. Now, the obvious benefit to this is that there's no chip to clip on, and so this becomes a thing where the attacker, to compromise the spy flash, has to actually compromise the peripheral controller, in this case, the T2, for instance. And that's obviously harder than just, you know, doing a physical attack. Uh, it's always better if you can make the attacker require more exploits to actually achieve their goal. But in the case of the T2, unfortunately, there was the checkmate attack which was a vulnerability found in the ROMs of iPhones, and eventually it was found to apply to the ROM of the T2, and that meant it was an unfixable vulnerability in the peripheral processor, which would mean the attacker could always gain code execution, and consequently they could always compromise the contents of the eSpy flash uh, before it was handed off to the x86. So that's a bad day. But, uh, but that, you know, then becomes the exact same countermeasures of, you know, trying to avoid those sort of vulnerabilities through typical exploit mitigations and everything else. All right, what else can we do here? Well, there's the option of if they have physically rewritten the spy flash chip and so they're persistent and every single boot the system is infected, uh, there's been a long uh, amount of research in the area of measured boot and remote attestation. And this is the concept of basically like, let's measure and see if anything has changed. Let's send it off in a trustworthy way to a remote appraiser. But uh, this can have problems and they were shown in you know, 2013. First by Yuri Belijin, who showed on an ASUS system that you know he could actually write into areas that were supposed to be measured by the BIOS. But BitLocker, which was at the time, you know, he had BitLocker configured with maximal protection. And it was supposed to be the case that you know, if any TPM measurements changed, then, you know, you shouldn't be able to get into the system. The, the key for decrypting your full disk encryption should not be made available because if the system was compromised early at boot in the BIOS, then of course they could steal the, uh, the, the they could steal your password as you're logging in and so forth and have the capability to uh, decrypt your hard drive. Now, Yuri showed that, you know, he could write to areas that were supposed to be measured, but were not actually being measured. And so consequently, you know, an attacker could put in, you know, proof of concept code, you know, we've got some 90s, little shell code here to show code execution. All right, uh, we showed the same sort of thing on a Dell, you know, enterprise grade laptop, and we showed it much more thoroughly because we did a full reverse engineering of the algorithm that it was using in order to uh, actually measure the system. But the key point here is that all of that sort of early work on measurement and attestation all it could really do was defend you against sort of bootloader and later type of attackers because the core root of trust, the core root of trust for measurement was in the BIOS itself. And therefore, if an attacker infected the BIOS itself, they could just modify what that code was reading and they could just, you know, replay known good expected measurements. And so we showed that sort of as a proof of concept attack in 2013, we showed we can infect and lie about the contents of the TPM PCRs. We also showed how we could, you know, having reverse engineered this entire algorithm, we could have the, the, the infection uh, compromise the system across firmware updates. So it could basically, we had, you know, the original version that infected and lied was called the tick. And then the flea would hop between BIOS updates each time, updating the calculations of what the expected measurement should be, and consequently always still having the capability to lie uh, for the measurement in the TPM and make the system look clean. So those are sort of not just, you know, it was architecturally incomplete because the root of trust for measurement was in mutable spy flash. And so, you know, the only way to deal with that is to have something immutable be responsible for taking that initial measurement. In the x86 architecture, since it's booting off of a spy flash chip, there's really nothing immutable to, you know, have be the measurement. So Intel added a new technology called BootGuard where the idea was that Intel would provide a Intel signed code blob, which should be immutable as long as no one compromises Intel's keys or some other assumptions. And so the idea was the Intel boot guard blob would be responsible for measuring this core root of trust, basically the, the reset vector. You wanted to make sure that you know the reset vector itself is not actually infected with malware. So some signed Intel blob measures the starting code here. And then as long as you trust that signed Intel blob, then you can trust that this thing is intact and this thing will do its subsequent measures, measurements of the rest of the range. So measurement attestation really only works if you're using something like Intel BootGuard to have a proper immutable core root of trust. But then BootGuard itself has other problems of misconfiguration and vulnerabilities, 
we're not going to cover that in this class. Uh, that'll be a topic for a future class. Got to go a lot deeper into that technology, but, um, but it's got its own little attack tree. So what else could an attacker do? Well, there is, you know, utilization of the dynamic root of trust for measurement instead of that static root of trust for, you know, detecting the measurement modification. And that would be technologies like Intel TXT. But once again, I'm going to have to punt and say that TXT is a class unto itself, uh, which hopefully they'll be making in the future because, you know, some of my research in the past utilized TXT for defensive purposes. And it is much more relevant these days because Microsoft has decided that they're going to use TXT and the AMD equivalent as a way to try to say, I don't care if the firmware is infected, I'm just going to spin up a trustworthy environment here and now and try to take it from there as a way of launching my hypervisor. So that's uh, Microsoft's secure launch technology. But there's other stuff that an attacker can do. So we need a little more space to talk about debugging, debugging as a way of potentially infecting the system. So neither of these things are going to help with debugging. None of these things well, this one a little bit, as we'll see a little later. But debugging is another way of an attacker potentially compromising the system. So if protected range registers and BIOS lock enable are set somewhere a little bit later in the boot sequence for the code, if the attacker can gate code execution via debugging interface, then they can go ahead and rewrite the BIOS before either of these things are in place, and that would yield a persistent way of getting code execution. So we need to talk a little bit about CPU technologies before we go on to the debugging technologies. There's pin grid array, which you would have seen on older systems where you've got an actual pins on the CPU and then holes or a socket on the board. You've got land grid array, where instead of pins, there's a bunch of just pads and the pins are actually on the board and the motherboard. So the pins are on the board. You press this in and they get pressed hard against some pins on the board. And then there's ball grid array where there's a bunch of solder balls which are just, you know, attached to the device and soldered on. So when it comes to debug options, the first, and we're, we're going to have this sort of uh, view of things from the harder, slower, expensive things that the attacker would like to not use unless they have to, to the easier, faster, cheaper things that the attacker would like to use if they can. So at the hard end of the scale, there is using a CPU interposer on a system that is unsocketed or BGA. So a CPU interposer, the idea is that you need to interpose on the signals between the CPU and the motherboard. So you can have things like this. Now, I don't think this is a, a interposer that Intel sells, but I don't believe that this particular type is actually uh, made for doing sort of debugging interposing. It's used for some other testing. But the idea is that an attacker would probably design a custom interposer and it would look something like this. They would have to then desolder the BGA chip and remove it, pick it up, put in the interposer, solder this back down. There's these things called solder masks where you can sort of reapply solder to a device, a BGA device that's been detached. And the idea is whatever your custom interposer is, it should be routing out the JTAG or debugging signals from the CPU because there will be debugging sig signals uh, as dedicated pins and Intel will tell you which pins are which. So the attacker will route out debug signals and consequently they will be able to get code execution early in the processor boot and in that way they could potentially then rewrite the flash chip. And then, you know, if, they're, if this is something where they're going to actually give it back to the victim, then they need to desolder this desolder this, resolder this, and you know, that is all fraught with peril in terms of the reliability of that actually working. So again, this is why this is the harder, slower, expensive thing. More likely than not, uh, it's more likely that someone would use a method like this on a board they themselves own in order to, uh, you know, unlock the system and get code execution for finding some vulnerabilities elsewhere in the system. Usually basically as an analysis tool rather than a infection tool, but on the harder, slower, expensive scale of things, it is technically a way that an attacker could, you know, compromise a victim system. Then there is things like active and unpopulated XDP and JTAG ports. Now, XDP is a custom Intel debugging interface. It is a 60-pin interface. And here we have a couple of views of things where it's depopulated. And the idea is an attacker who sees a motherboard like this can basically you know, reattach the debugging interface to this and consequently just connect up and get debug access. Now, that one picture was taken from this. So I went and I looked up uh, an old picture of 
the the laptops we were using back at MITRE to do our proof of concept attacks. And you know, here you can see that this is a socketed uh, CPU. So one option might be to you know put a uh, interposer in that. But over here we've got that XDP, and we rotate it like so, and you can even see that it's labeled as XDP. So the idea is that an attacker would resolder on the debug port right here and then connect to the debugger. Now that might seem a little far-fetched, but actually again, back to the NSA documentation, uh, there was one particular thing called God Surge with the Flux Babbit hardware. And the documentation said that through interdiction, the JTAG scan chain must be reconnected on the target system by removing the motherboard from the chassis and attaching the depopulated parts back onto the circuit board. So they were specifically saying for Dell PowerEdge 2950 and PowerEdge 1950 servers, they had these little hardware implants. And the idea was they took out the motherboard, reattached the debugging interface, the JTAG interface, and then they stuck these little hardware implants in the servers. And then they would sit there and have the capability to uh, reload hard. They would reload software implants into the system via these hardware implants. Now, I spent uh, way too much time actually trying to go look at the motherboards for those Dell PowerEdge 2950s. Uh, I was just kind of looking, what are these depopulated things they're connecting back to? This is one theory right here that kind of looks like a XDP port. Uh, you can see that they're socketed CPUs as well. But if you looked at a full picture of these, like this is generally covered up. These have heat sinks on it, of course. Um, there was another one right here, and that looks very Dell-like in the sense of it's got that square, it's got those two pins right there for, for plugging a thing back in to make it uh, stable for soldering back on. And so this, this might be it as well, but this might also be, you know, JTAG access to some other little chip. Like these are the main chips right here, main heat sinks. This might be something like, you know, the PCH or something like that. I don't know, but uh, I wasted way too much time trying to look and see if there was an easy place. That other one, like I said, is covered up, so that's not really a good place for a hardware implant, as far as I know. You know, who knows? Maybe there's space. This one was much more out in the open, so maybe that would be a better space for something. Because it was also covered up by, like, uh, hard drives and I don't even know what, PCI cards, stuff like that. So, like, you wouldn't actually be able to see right here when you look at the fully populated, fully filled-in server motherboard. Only if you, like, disassemble it down might you see some little thing. And, you know, you might just think, well, that's just another expansion card. So anyways, then further along the options for an attacker who wants to get debug access, there's a CPU interposer with a socketed CPU. So here, if there was something like that, that's much easier to plug into. You just plug in a little custom, you know, interposer, and then, you know, the CPU goes into the socket as well. Now, that particular one is for a land grid array thing. This is a pin grid array thing. But again, the point is, you know, Intel sells some of these things for uh, OEMs who are actually building the hardware. And, you know, it's just $2,100, right? So that makes it outside of what a typical hobbyist is going to spend. But, you know, a real actual motivated attacker, you know, that's peanuts, right? So then what else do we have? Well, then there's the top side probe. Again, $2,100. And, you know, what is this? How does that work? Well, I happen to have some old pictures laying around as I was going back and looking through things. So here's an old MacBook Air that, you know, we did a proof of concept attack on. So this is the CPU here. This is the PCH over here. Or maybe it's the GPU, I forget. But you basically take the heat sink off of that and then you're left with something like this and some uh, XDP 60 pin port-ish looking thing. This is actually 64, but I think there's like two unused things on either side. Anyways, then you, you know, keep disassembling it. You got some little buffer things there, remove those. And what you ultimately come up with is a CPU that has a whole bunch of pins right here. And these are the pins that a top side probe attaches to. I didn't find it, but I actually am pretty sure I remember I'm basically using a continuity tester to check, you know, this pin connects to that, that pin connects to that, just to kind of prove to myself that, you know, that was an XDP port right there. All right, then there's a little clip right here that's sort of spring-loaded, and it's to hold the interposer in place. Um, basically, it's just to sort of hold it in the right location so that these pins are actually uh, placed in the right thing. On the interposer, there's a bunch of little pins, little pogo pins there that are spring-loaded pins that are going to connect to those topside probe pins. And then you throw a heat sink on it as well, because otherwise the processor will get too hot too fast and consequently will shut down. So you use your mastery of the mystic arts in order to hold this all together and, you know, use the debugging like that. This wire right here then goes out to the debugger off to the side. 
So then we finally get to some of the easier things. There's a active and populated XDP port, and that would look something like this. So this is the Intel Minnow board. Uh, this is something they used to sell and which I would have liked to use for this class, but unfortunately they don't sell it anymore. But the idea is that it's just got this XDP port right there. You can see that is what the port actually looks like. It's a 60 pin port and you just connect directly to that and using the appropriate software, you will be able to debug the processor from the reset vector. But the modern and easiest and best option these days is something called DCI, Direct Connect Interface, where basically Intel has exposed debug out via the USB ports. So that's cool, that's easy, that's nice and cheap as well. So let's talk about the debuggers themselves. Those were just the means of attaching, then you need some sort of debugger and software. Well, for all of these things, from the CPU interposers down to the XDB ports, these are generally on Intel systems. They were you know, mediated by this XDP custom Intel interface. To access that, you would need something like this. This was a third-party asset Arium. You can see the little uh, XDP interface there. This one is actually my version because I couldn't find any pictures on the internet that showed the XDP port and the full thing. So that cost about $10,000 between the hardware and the software. So again, not exactly the kind of thing that a typical hobbyist is actually going to use. Now there's another option that Intel would sell to people who signed the NDA, and that was the you know, Intel version of this. You can see again, debug port XDP right there. That was cheaper at around uh, $3,000. But down here, like I said, modern systems, you can just use USB ports, and that is much, much, much cheaper. So this is then the Intel uh, closed chassis debug uh, interface, and that was available for $390. But on super modern systems, you know, if you're talking, you know, seventh generation and later, you could actually have it be the case that you don't even need this, and you could just use a special USB cable that, you know, has the VBUS signal removed from it. And that can be had for the low, low price of just $18. So obviously on modern systems, you know, things have come a long way from when I had to spend $10,000 Modern systems you can connect up and fiddle around uh, with just these. And I'll provide some links to uh, modern enablement uh, mechanisms. So what can you do about any of that? Well, at least when it comes to using debug access for ephemeral code execution to then rewrite the BIOS before these protections are in place, that is again where something like BootGuard could help because you know it would the reset vector would be measured by some uh, signed and verified Intel code blob and you know assuming that the the oem had actually done their due diligence and not found themselves vulnerable to any of these uh, boot guard bypasses then you could at least potentially detect it and depending on the configuration boot guard can actually stop the system from booting if it's found of course that just means that you know you're breaking your system but you know potentially depending on the security requirements you're looking for breaking it and being able to go do a firmware forensics investigation is a lot better and allowing the system to continue to boot into an infected thing. Now, when it comes to DCI connectors, there is a capability to disable DCI, but uh, it can actually just be re-enabled via you know, physical rewrites of the spy flash and or uh, some pins. So there's a soft strap there that we talked about before as a way of avoiding having to do an actual physical pin modification, but an attacker who has physical access could potentially use the uh, hard strap as well. For the XDP connector, you can obviously depopulate XDP on your motherboard, but the attacker, as we saw with that flux babbit, could just repopulate it if they really want. If they really want to infect the thing badly, they can just solder the stuff back on. And interestingly, with that NSA stuff, you know, in the case of the server, they soldered it back on. They stuck a chunk of hardware in there because they were so confident that people weren't going to be looking for that kind of thing. Now, in terms of the top side probe, I don't know if there's actually any defense against that. I don't know. I mean, certainly Intel did make some chips that didn't have those pins on the top, but I don't know if they actually make those chips anymore. I don't know if you can use them in all scenarios. So, you know, someone from Intel is going to have to tell me whether there's any actual viable defense against someone getting code execution via Topside Pro. And the same thing with CPU Interposer. Again, if someone with enough electrical engineering background wants to, they can build custom interposers. They can, you know, get that code execution. Uh, and then they can use that to rewrite, where again, the defense would be something like boot card. So well, that's it for our investigation of spy, flash, write protection, and attacks. So we filled in the last little bit about uh, looking at the PCI DRAM controller. We covered the flash write protection, and we've now covered all of the attacks.